Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm so pleased to welcome you back to Economics for Everyone. Uh, this is the beginning of Block 3. Our first lecture is addressed to the measurement of macroeconomic activity. And the series of four lectures we'll have in this block are all addressed to macroeconomics. So the first part of the uh, course, you'll recall, was um, an introduction, a motivation, um, meant to get us both used to the methods and to the substance of economics. Uh, the idea that we need to think abstractly with models, but also to use those models to answer substantive questions. We talked a little bit about a model of economic growth, uh, the Malthusian mo model of economic uh, development. But along the way, we also learned many important uh, elements of our grammar and our vocabulary. The importance of thinking uh, marginally for economists is absolutely central. Most activities are characterized by the relationship between a diminishing marginal benefit and rising marginal cost. And out of that falls notions of opportunity costs and comparative advantage that motivate um, the whole, our whole understanding of exchange and the value of exchange that occurs in, in, in markets. And this is a natural segue into what we learned in the second block of the course during the second third. Um, the study of microeconomics, and um, often we, stu we struggle with definitions, but microeconomics has a clear definition from um, Lionel Robbins. It refers to the um, efficient allocation of scarce resources, making the most uh, that we possibly can of the constraints and the limits that the environment poses upon us. And indeed, um, this definition of the subject is often, or, or rather the subject is often characterized into these two broad areas, microeconomics on the one hand and macroeconomics on the other. Um, that in some measure is a, a convenient but perhaps an artificial uh, distinction. But unlike microeconomics, macroeconomics is not so much concerned with allocative uh, efficiencies or inefficiencies, but with the overall aggregate level of economic activity in the market or in the society. And so that's what we'll, um, we'll struggle with over the next three uh, uh, lectures, or next four uh, uh, lectures. And I thought I'd introduce the uh, subject by dwelling, as we usually do, into some motivating facts and how those facts have played a role in the history of economic thought uh, and how that interaction between uh, theory and data and public policy interests moves our understanding forward. So um, I very much uh, appreciate the chance to engage with you over the next uh, four weeks as we end the semester. I want to thank everybody for submitting their uh, assignments. And over the course of the next week, I will read those and get those back to you. And we'll spend a little time at the end of this lecture um, raising some administrative concerns or issues that uh, we might want to talk about collectively as, as, as we move uh, forward. So let's dive into uh, macroeconomics. In these next four lectures, we're going to spend uh, two of them discussing measurement issues, how to measure the aggregate economy, and some important indicators associated um, with its state, whether it is up or down, uh, moving forward or backward. Um, we'll talk about gross domestic product, its meaning, its measurement, its use, and that's what the subject of this lecture is. And in the next lecture, we'll talk about two other important indicators, uh, unemployment and inflation. Now, macroeconomists are concerned with other things as well, with interest rates, ex foreign exchange rates, trade balances. Um, uh, but we're going to restrict our conversation to sort of a closed macroeconomy. Obviously, 
in four lectures you can't cover this topic. So just as we did with microeconomics, we're going to sort of get the basics and the core uh, that you need, the core vocabulary that you need to be articulate in your understanding and your reading of uh, popular media and public policy discussions. But that's going to require more than just a, um, an understanding of the meaning and measurement of macroeconomic indicators. We're also going to need a model, a framing, a way of thinking about the interactions in the macroeconomy. And this is actually a very interesting time to be studying macroeconomics, um, not just because of the, uh, the Great Recession that many of the rich countries went through beginning in 2008 and its aftermath over the last 10 years or, or so, but even the current developments in this last month, um, this pandemic that has uh, ripped through the entire global economy certainly has macroeconomic implications uh, in, a, in a way that is unprecedented. So in some sense, it's not an exaggeration to say that we're living through uh, history here. Um, and I hope that some of the uh, tools that you're exposed to in the coming weeks help you make a little bit of sense of the economic fallout of this uh, terrible health crisis that we're living through. These data, coupled with uh, our understanding of them through theory, are, is going to motivate the conduct of public policy. So that's always what we've been interested in this course, and it plays out in macroeconomics by an understanding of fiscal policy and monetary policy. Fiscal policy refers to the spending and taxing decisions of government. It's wrapped up in the notion of a budget, whether that budget is in surplus or deficit, uh, whether to raise taxes, to lower them, to increase spending, to cut spending. These are all concerns of fiscal policy and usually the domain of one part of government, the, uh, the Treasury, or in other countries, um, uh, the Ministry of, of Finance. Another side to macroeconomic policy is monetary policy. The influence that the government can have over the money supply and over some interest rates and the impact that that has on um, uh, the macroeconomy. And that's usually delegated, and increasingly in our time, you know, with a certain amount of independence, to central bankers. In the United States, the central bank uh, is called the Federal Reserve. It's, um, it's actually a little bit more decentralized than in other countries with a number of uh, satellite offices they, uh, that make up the entire Federal Reserve. For example, in New York City, the, um, the Fed, as it's called, uh, the New York Fed, is located not too far from our campus um, uh, in um, downtown um, Manhattan. Um, but there are others of these, but there's a, a chairman of the Federal Reserve, and um, he has, and his team have, authority over the conduct of monetary policy. Central banks in other countries are much more centralized in a single institution, um, but um, basically you can understand macroeconomic policy as falling into these two um, broad envelopes of fiscal and monetary policy. And so how should those policies be conducted? Uh, it depends really upon your understanding of the macroeconomy, the model you use uh, to make sense of it all. Uh, and um, we are going to study only one of those models, uh, a short period or a short run Keynesian model. And that type of thinking and the whole notion of macroeconomics, this whole part of economics, that came out of the experiences in the 1930s. And so that's where I want to begin with a look at the unemployment rate in the United States um, after 1929 and into the 1940s. There was no such thing as macroeconomics before 
this tremendous shock, uh, I should say, one in a series of shocks called a uh, depression that hit the United States. In 1929, at the, at the end of the, the jazz era, when F. Scott Fitzgerald was writing about the great Gatsby, um, the unemployment rate sat at around 3 or 4 percent in the United States, and then over the subsequent three years rose quite sharply to reach 25 percent. One quarter of the American labor force was unemployed. Now I'm leaving aside a lot of subtleties in the definition of unemployment, and we'll get to that, to that in the next letter, lecture. But the other thing that this graph makes clear is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that this um, sharp increase in the unemployment rate um, uh, was not uh, immediately reversed in the subsequent years. The unemployment rate remained elevated for more than a a decade, and it was only as the United States entered World War II in the 1940s that we saw significant falls in the unemployment rate and a return to the pre-depression era. And so this number, this statistic, is behind it lies the lives of many, many uh, people. This is when Steinbeck wrote The, Grape, the, the Grapes of Wrath, for example. And it's a, a real telling story of what life was like for some parts of the American society at that time. So this is a statistic with real meaning, um, real loss, and real heartbreak behind it. And so you can imagine that there was a lot of pressure to do something. And to do something, you need to sort of understand the situation. You need a theory to be able to formulate policy. And our natural way of thinking of this, coming from the microeconomics block of the course, is to think in terms of those demand and supply curves for an aggregate labor market. And here I give you a picture of Arthur Pigou someone we met briefly in microeconomics. Uh, Pigo was responsible for conceptualizing the notion of externalities and the idea that taxation can be used to correct this market failure. And he taught in Cambridge University in the United Kingdom um, around the time that Alfred Marshall was there in the first decades of the 1900s. And he was primed, like many other economists, to think of this massive unemployment in microeconomic terms. And we saw a little bit of that. If you can imagine a demand and a supply curve for labor, um, you would ask yourself as a microeconomics, what is preventing the economy from adjusting to an equilibrium? in which everyone who wants a job has a job, in which the demand for labor is consistent with the supply at some price. Well, it has to be that something is preventing the price, the wage rate, from adjusting. It's in some measure too high, and that means that there's an excess supply of labor services over what's demanded, and we call that excess supply unemployment. And so what's the block? Why aren't labor markets more flexible? Why doesn't the wage rate adjust to equilibrate that market? And so you're in this frame of thinking drawn to frictions in the market. Is it unions that are stopping the uh, wage from adjusting? Is it minimum wages? Is it government regulations and taxes? And uh, it moves you, this way of thinking, in the direction of removing these impediments to adjustment. Um, and Pigo also wrote about this, and his writings make a cameo appearance in one of the greatest books on macroeconomics. The, the book is on 
pretty well dated as starting the subject, a book by John Maynard Keynes. There's Maynard. I took this picture from the internet. I suppose it's in his library. And um, Maynard, Maynard um, Keynes, in the general theory, uh, really takes Pigou to task. It takes the whole intellectual apparatus that supported economic thinking uh, to task. He was born in 1883 and died in 1946, but the major date is 1936 when the general theory of employment, interest, and money uh, was published. That's the book that starts macroeconomics. Now Keynes was an interesting uh, fellow. He was a student at at Cambridge and, and taught there. He was a student of Alfred Marshall and, and much of his approach and thinking is, is, is Marshallian. Um, and, um, uh, but he also had a home in London. If you find yourself in, in the United Kingdom in London, uh, go to the Bloomsbury area and there's a small park there, Gordon Square. And on the edge of Gordon Square, you'll, you'll find Keynes's London residence. He was part of the uh, artistic and cultural movement called the Bloomsbury Group. Keynes married a uh, beautiful Russian ballerina, um, but he was gay, uh, and he was a patron in this arts community, uh, an advisor to government, and worked in government as well in in in, in the Treasury. Uh, was involved in a small way after World War I in the repatriations and designing the repatriations that um, uh, the United Kingdom and France imposed upon Germany. He was a critic of that, a very big critic, and he wrote a book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, where he foreshadowed that the reparation, reparations would lead to much more um, heartache, desolation, and, and uh, turmoil in the coming years. Um, towards the end of his life, he was one of the architects of the Bretton Woods system, um, which was negotiated in, in New Hampshire and Bretton Woods. Uh, you can also visit the hotel um, where that treaty which laid the foundations for the um, international economic order after World War II, and the institutions of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank call, all came out of negotiations conducted at that, uh, at, that, at, at that time. But it was in the 1930s with the Great Depression raging throughout um, the rich world that Keynes wrote the general theory of employment, interest, and money. And that's the, um, the macroeconomic model that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. But here is motivation in our times as well. I've taken this data on unemployment rates from the OECD. When I look for um, comparable unemployment rates across countries, that's my go-to website. Each country, of course, produces its own uh, unemployment rates, but there are subtle differences between them. The uh, dark line is the United States. And once again, you see that in um, 2006, 2007, and the early part of 2008, the American unemployment rate is in the neighborhood of around between 4 and 5 percent, and once again shot up dramatically, rising to uh, 10 percent uh, in about 2010. Um, that is a very dramatic uh, change. And that heralded what we now call uh, the Great uh, Recession. So if you remember Occupy Wall Street, and you remember all the turmoil and the collapse of the housing market 
um, in that period, that was the Great Recession behind this uh, statistic. The video we watched at the beginning of the class, um, the presentation by Joe Stiglitz, was filmed, if you recall, around 2009, 2010. Actually, it won't be a bad idea for you to actually um, rewatch that uh, 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 video. And then, in spite of this very sharp run-up in the unemployment rate, you see this gradual decline. So that the unemployment rate doesn't return back to its pre-recession level around, until around 2016. And then it continued to fall to historic lows, reaching in um, the early part of uh, 2020, in the neighborhood of uh, 3% or, 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 uh, or so. I also offer you information on Australia and, and Canada, and also uh, 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 unemployment rate for the European Union. And you see very different patterns around um, these countries. And you might wonder why the differences between them is it institutions? Is it policy? In particular, if you look at the unemployment rate for the European Union, it does start off much higher than the United States at around 7% in 2008, shoots up, and then pauses and shoots up again before finally beginning its fall. So you might wonder, what's that about? <laughs> uh, well, hint, it had something to do with monetary policy and the conduct of monetary and fiscal policy in the European Union versus in other countries. I've gone off to the data for two countries, to uh, Canada and to the United States, and picked up the most recent numbers, which were just released a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and the, the sharp increase in the unemployment rate in the United States at the very end uh, here is starting to capture the, um, the physical distancing economy that we found ourselves into. Those data refer to the first part of March, just before the lockdowns occurred. All right. in, in Canada, the data refer to about the third week of March and things that already started. You can bet when these numbers come out in uh, April, they are going to be this high or more, close to 10%, if not. This is gonna be a historic change in um, the unemployment rate. You know it already in your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and the data are starting to show that in a real way. Um, yeah, a very unique experience. So we'll talk a little bit, I think, as we once we formulate our model, about the challenges that the macro uh, economy faces as a result of this very peculiar shock. Recessions uh, refer to uh, cyclical movement in the aggregate economy. They're that phase when the aggregate economy is falling and then the economy uh, m turns the corner and moves into a recovery period and then into an expansion and a boom reaching a peak and then the process starts again. Um, the recessions um, in the post-war era have a certain similarity to them but also each one is very, uh, uh, very different. So we're motivating this conversation um, that we're having over the next three or four weeks with data like this. What determines these big up and downs in the, um, in the overall economic activity of the economy? Well, if you thought that was fun, I've just taken I've just taken uh, the data I presented you in the previous graph and added two other, three other countries, uh, Italy, Spain, and Greece. And uh, the situation is amazingly different in these countries. Uh, Italy shows an entirely different uh, a pattern, never really recovering uh, from the, the Great Recession. Now faced with another terrible shock. And Greece and Spain had the impact of the recession like no other country in the European system. And uh, still a very gradual fall. 
And you can bet that these changes have affected young people much more than other groups in that society, in these societies as well. So uh, what I'm suggesting by showing these cross-country comparisons is that probably the way policy is conducted and the linkage between economies is going to be very important. So you can conduct macro policy in a bad way and in a good way that is going to influence outcomes for many millions of people. Right. So, well, this is not so going to be such a surprise for me to say this to you. This stuff is important. And every citizen should have an opinion on it, but an informed and an articulate opinion. And I hope over the next three or four weeks that you take some major steps in the way you approach this subject in developing that opinion. And I hope I can help you out uh, in that in some way. So, as I've done in past lectures, I want to give you a little bit of economics as literature. And where should I go to except to the general theory? And um, chapter one of the general theory is one paragraph, one page long. And this is what Keynes says. I have called this book the general theory of employment, interest, and money placing the emphasis on the prefix general. The object of such a title is to contrast the character of my arguments and conclusions with those of the classical theory of the subject, upon which I was brought up and which dominates the economic thought, both practical and theoretical, of the governing and academic classes of this generation as it has for a hundred years past. Now, this is not a man without ego. He's throwing the gauntlet down. Everything you've learned for the past hundred years is wrong. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And he's saying that both in theory and in practice. I shall argue that the postulates of the classical theory are applicable to a special case only and not to the general case, the situation which it assumes being a limiting point of the possible positions of equilibrium. So I've always asked you to think of equilibrium as a position of rest. It's where the economy comes to rest and there are no forces to move it from that position. Think of a marble placed on the edge of the bowl, rolling down the side of the bowl, and it eventually, after going back and forth a few times, comes to rest at the bottom. In microeconomics, we think of the equilibrium as being optimal in some sense, of being Pareto uh, if efficient and unique. And Keynes is saying, no, there are a whole host of possible resting points for the economy. The classical theory you've learned, that is microeconomics writ large to the uh, aggregate economy, uh, assumes there's only one. But there are many, and in particular, the economy can come to rest at an equilibrium in which, which implies a good deal of waste of human resources, which implies a good deal of unemployment, and which requires active government intervention. Finally, chapter one concludes, moreover, the characteristics of the special case assumed by the classical theory happen not to be those of the economic society in which we actually live, with the result that its teaching is misleading and disastrous if we attempt to apply it to the facts of experience. So he's doing theory based upon his understanding of the facts in order to motivate policy. And if you have the wrong theory, you're going to cause disaster. And that is his view of the classical theory of the macro economy and the policy recommendations it suggested, those that I hinted to uh, at earlier. Well, let's begin then with uh, the facts and with measurement issues. And um, I'm going to talk today about GDP, gross domestic product, its meaning, its measurement, and its use. Now, 
GDP is not a thing that exists out there. Statistical agents don't, agencies don't go running around the streets of New York looking behind bushes or on grocery store shelves for this thing called GDP. It's a construct. It's a construct that comes from theory. And we need theory to be able to categorize, measure, and put together this thing that is going to represent overall macroeconomic activity. Richard Stone is, was a British economist also at, at Cambridge, different college from uh, Keynes's, and he was responsible for using the theory in Keynes's book to develop what's, what are called the national accounts. And he would regularly produce these national accounts in his office in, in Cambridge and was a very important player uh, in government uh, policy ma uh, making. And uh, his ideas, of course, uh, spread around the world. And there were other important um, uh, players in the development of national income accounting. Uh, Simon Kuznets, uh, in addition to Stone, and Leontief. Uh, Kuznets and Leontief were both Harvard uh, e economists. And um, together, collectively, uh, they, um, in collaboration with statistical agencies and many other researchers, developed a consistent way of defining and measuring overall aggregate economic activity. Um, this was a very dynamic area of economics in the 50s and 60s, and many young graduate students would go into national income accounting. It's, uh, it's not as um, popular amongst academics as it is now, and many academic ec economists have only um, a rather thin understanding of the details of national income accounting, but and there is a great deal of expertise now wrapped up in the government agencies. And national income accounting is coordinated by the United Nations. There are several revisions that um, best practice has gone through, and these are encapsulated in thick manuals that run to hundreds and hundreds of uh, pages. And they're the touchstones for national statistical agencies uh, around uh, the world. And so every year, uh, the heads of the statistical agencies meet here in New York. Uh, where is the UN at, at, at 42nd and, 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 and first in that, in, in that area um, for an annual conference and continual refining of these um, things. I actually spent a um, sabbatical at Harvard a few years ago and had an office and uh, in the economics department and outside of the office was this bookcase and I passed this bookcase and on it was mounted this plaque every morning as I struggled to open my unlock my office door there was this plaque commemorating Simon Kuznets so I sort of took it to mean that perhaps the office I had occupied was Kuznets at one point I don't know if that's true or not, but anyways, it's not really relevant. <laughs> um, but there is this plaque, and it says, I hope you can read it, before there was theory, after there was measurement. Um, my own view is actually uh, there's an interaction between theory, measurement, and policy. It's, it's a dance with uh, three partners, uh, but very much from the framing that Kuznets was coming from and the development of the national accounts, this was very much the case. There was no measurement of the aggregate economy before Keynes's general theory. So what is gross domestic product? Let's first start with a definition and work our way through that definition. This is a definition that I, I want you to know. Gross domestic product is the total final market value of all goods and services produced in a country's economy during some particular period of time, usually a year. Okay, That's what it is 
It is no more. It is no less than that. Please memorize that definition. Let's pull it apart. Gross domestic product. What does gross mean? Gross simply means that it's the total market value, that it does not account in particular for the depreciation of assets used in the production process. If you subtract depreciation costs from gross, you get nest, net domestic product. And that is what uh, we really have to use to invest and to consume. Uh, the net domestic product. Okay, So gross is the overall measure before depreciation. That's what that means. The other key thing is final market value. We are going to make market valuations. So that means we need two things to do that. Prices and quantities. Okay, We want to add everything up. But we can't add apples to oranges, right? Uh, but we can add the value of money spent on apples plus the value of money spent on oranges. And so we're talking about a price and a quantity across all goods and pro uh, services produced in the economy. Okay? By final, we mean we want to avoid double counting. All right? So we want the value of the cappuccino to figure into uh, GDP, all right? And that value reflects the money producers had to spend on milk and on coffee, and then the value that they add to that milk and coffee. We're not going to take the value of the cappuccino, add it to the value of the milk, and the value of the coffee. We're just going to use the value of the cappuccino, the final value. Okay. The other important distinction is total final market value. We are measuring market activities. That's what GDP refers to. It refers to economic activity in the market. Look, listen, let me tell you a personal story. I, um, in my younger days, um, was a bit more entrepreneurial than I am now, and I ran a small business. It was a, a type of um, uh, soft landscaping, uh, house repair business. I would clean yards, uh, where appropriate, cut gra grass, make small repairs. And I had a number of clients. And everything was done legally. That's to say I wasn't working in an underground economy. Um, uh, um, I kept track of all of my receipts. Uh, paid all of my taxes, recorded my revenues. Okay, People would pay me uh, for a service. There was a market exchange. And so I was adding to gross domestic product. With every extra client I had, the GDP went up. And I had this one client, a woman that lived on her own, and she was a faithful client. And, uh, and I think I was doing a good job for her. And and I think she felt so as well. And one day she asked me to marry her. And she seemed like a reasonable person. And so I said yes. And so I continued to offer up to that household the same services. I would um, do small repairs. I uh, would clean up the yard, uh, cut the grass, uh, take out the garbage, all the things I was doing uh, before. But now she did not pay me. My production moved from the market to a non-market activity and it did not contribute to GDP. Now obviously I'm, I'm being a bit of a joker here, uh, <laughs> uh, but the point is there is this division between market and non-market activities and the maintaining of households, the raising of children is not valued in the market and it doesn't figure in the GDP. And in fact um, the uh, disproportionate burden of those non-market activities uh, falls on women and that influences their capacity to, uh, historically has influenced their capacity to engage in, in, in market uh, uh, activities. But there's a lot of activity that takes place that is not valued by GDP. 
Okay, but that's what GDP is, market value. All goods and services. So it encompasses, or in principle should encompass everything. Physical goods and services, all right? Uh, so there's an interesting point in economic thought. Adam Smith uh, in The Wealth of Nations thought that services were uh, unproductive. And so he was very old school, well, writing in 1776, uh, we'll give him that. Uh, and he only saw the production of goods, manufacturing as being productive. And in The Wealth of Nations, he even uses this example of um, music lessons, of violin lessons, not adding to overall welfare. Obviously, that is not the case. We want to capture everything. Um, but, but the economy evolves, and what we think of services is really a very challenging to, to measure, uh, to value. It has to have a price, and um, especially in the digital economy, uh, this is really challenging. There's a lovely book that I've put on this section of the reading list by Diane Coyle uh, on uh, GDP, and I'm drawing a large part of this lecture from that book. And she takes a, a loving but critical uh, look at uh, the measurement of overall economic activity through this economic lens and talks about many of the challenges that GDP has. And one of those is uh, getting a, a good grasp of valuing uh, services uh, and, and particularly the digital uh, economy. Finally, this occurs within national borders. Now, obviously, we can speak of global GDP but that is built on, uh, upon um, a whole host of national estimates. So we're talking about a country's activity within the country's border, but not based upon the nationality of the residents of the country. So there are many non-Americans and non-American firms actively involved and engaged in economic activity within the borders of the United States. Just as there are Ameri many American firms engaged in activities in other countries. The gross national product is the gross domestic product plus net foreign payments. All of the profits that are repatriated to other countries from the United States um, uh, to the owners of that capital plus all of the profits um, that flow into the United States from activities abroad, that net flow when added to GDP gives you the gross national product, which is based by, uh, which gives you the activity of national entities. So sometimes you'll see these two terms, and if there isn't a lot of foreign activity uh, of a, in a country and, and a country's activity abroad, They'll be very similar, but sometimes they diverge significantly. This is sort of his, was uh, recently, and probably still is, uh, the case uh, in Ireland as many foreign firms set up shop there for tax purposes, uh, recorded profits uh, 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 there, but did not actually have a great deal of economic activity in those national boundaries. So GDP and GMP can diverge depending up upon um, the balance in net foreign payments. Generally, the consensus is to measure economic activity within a country's borders, we rely on GDP. And that wasn't always the case, actually. And then there's this sense of time to this. Usually, it's measured over an annual horizon. You will see quarterly estimates of GDP, and sometimes people even, some countries sometimes are even trying to get monthly measures of activity, although that's a statistical challenge. But what we're talking about here is a flow, not a stock, all right? So let me bring in, I think I have before in the class, the bathtub model. Think of your bathtub. You turn the tap on, water starts flowing in, okay? That's what we're interested in, is in that flow. But something else happens in the bathtub. The level of water in the flat bathtub starts to rise and might reach uh, a sort of equilibrium if, uh, if the uh, inflow and the outflow are the same. And that's a stock. So it's a distinction, for example, between income and wealth. All right? So 
GDP is not a measure of wealth. It's a measure of income. It's the flow. It's not the stock. Here's an example. A wildfire rages through significant parts of California. The state jumps into actions. Firefighters are working overtime. More helicopters are hired. More resources are used. Thousands and thousands of acres of trees are burnt down. A lot of money is spent in, in uh, putting out the fire. GDP has gone up because more money has spent. But the national wealth, uh, if you take stock of all of the natural resources around us, clearly has had something very different happen to it. Okay? So it's very important to think of this in, in this way of a, uh, of a flow. And obviously, um, some part of the flow is saved and invest, and it, it changes our wealth and our stock. But we're not measuring that wealth. We're measuring the flow when we talk about GDP. So don't think of it as national wealth. It is what it is, and not anymore. Gross domestic product is the total final market value of all goods and services produced in a country's economy during a specific period of time, period. We often use this diagram, and I've, this is my rendition of a picture that is in uh, Coyle's book. Obviously, very, very simplified. And I just want you to think in terms of what of the flows in this diagram. This is called the circular flow diagram. We have all households in the economy and we have all firms in the economy. These are the two actors and they interact in two different ways. They interact in what we've called up until now factor markets. In factor markets households are the sellers and they sell their services to firms. Firms use those services, combine them with other uh, inputs and in exchange, they give the households income. And so factor markets imply that a certain amount of income is generated in the economy. We could measure GDP by measuring all of the incomes earned in the economy. But households and firms also interact in, in product markets, in commodity markets. Now households aren't the sellers, they're the buyers. They purchase goods and services from firms and give the firms money and the firms give them the things that they want. Okay? And so there's also, also this interaction in commodity markets. We could measure also the total economic activity in the market by tallying up all of the expenditures in the economy. And all these expenditures must equal all of the incomes earned. All right? Now there's a third way of, of, of measuring economic activity, and it has to do with the value added at each stage of production in this part of the process. So we look at all of the firms and we look at, uh, through input-output tables, how all the firms uh, interact. And at each stage in the production process, we take count of the change in the value of the, uh, the good as it moves from one firm to the next firm on its way to uh, consumers. So there's this also this value-added way of totaling up uh, economic activity. So this circular flow diagram comes from general, uh, the framework in, in Keynes's general uh, theory and lays down uh, a taxonomy, uh, a way of measuring GDP. It's basically double entry bookkeeping um, that, that's going on here. Sorry, just had to take a drink. So let's talk about measurement. As I've alluded to, there's the expenditure method, the income method, and the output method. 
You know, if macroeconomics had a t-shirt, it would be this equation embossed on the t-shirt. GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. The expenditure method is the sum of all final purchases, purchases by consumers, by investors, by government, and then the difference between exports and imports. So G here is the deficit, or as it may be, uh, the, sur the, the surplus. The income method, as I suggested, is the sum of all incomes earned by the factors of production. And it's an accounting identity that it, the income method has to lead to the same number as the expenditure method. Now, obviously, we can't do, statistical agencies can't do a perfect job of measuring um, uh, all these activities. And so there's um, uh, a statistical dis discrepancy that happens. But in principle, they should be the same. And so when you look at national income accounts, there's always space for a statistical dis discrepancy, a fudge factor to make sure things are equal. Now, obviously, um, there is an underground economy here um, that is, some, is not often, by definition, captured because those exchanges are kept out of the visible market. And that's always a challenge, and it's always going to be bigger or smaller, uh, depending upon uh, the country and the situation. So in some less rich countries, there are so-called underground, gray, uh, black markets in which a lot of activity occurs, but it's not captured in official uh, uh, statistics. But that's a question of practicalities, um, uh, not, not a question of principle. And finally, as I suggested, the output method is the sum of value added in the production uh, uh, process. And I, I gave you the example earlier of uh, the, the cappuccino. A, um, a uh, coffee shop is going to sell a cappuccino and we're only interested in that value of the cappuccino. And the value of that cappuccino is gonna be sum of all of the income payments made to produce it, or it's going to be the amount that the consumer pays for it, or it's going to be the sum of all of the um, additions to value in the supply chain that got that, the milk, the beans, and the capital stock to the, uh, the coffee house. So I've Gone to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. This is a hot link, so if you download the presentation, you can go and see uh, the details there. And there's a lot more details, so I've just summarized here the gross domestic product for the United States in uh, 2019. The United States is a $21 trillion uh, economy. And consumer expenditures are a big chunk of that. Almost two-thirds of the GDP comes from uh, personal consumption expenditures. So I'm looking at it just from the expenditure method. Um, gross investment, private investment, is another 18 or so uh, percent, and it's broken down into different categories. Uh, consumers spend their money on goods and services, and these should add up to the, uh, I hope they do, the uh, total uh, expenditures. And also there's non-residential uh, fixed investment, residential uh, fixed investment, and changes in inventories over the year that make up uh, gross domestic investment. This is the balance between exports and imports. In this year, imports were valued greater than exports, so there's a negative number uh, coming here. And and then uh, the, the government figure is here. And, and all of these bold numbers should add up to what, 21 uh, trillion. But you can see why macroeconomists get very nervous if consumers don't keep up their spending, because they are a big part of the economy. Traditionally, the volatility in the economy comes from uh, investment. And we'll talk about this more when we get to the theory. Um, but in this particular um, uh, expansion of the last couple of years, 
it's really been consumers driving things, and they're a big weight in the overall uh, figure. This is just to give you a sense of scale. Often when you see these numbers reported in um, the press as they are done on a quarterly basis, um, the focus is on um, rates of change, quarterly or annual uh, uh, rates of change, not on overall uh, levels. But I'm giving you these numbers just to give you a sense of scale and, and how GDP is divided between its main components. So obviously there is a lot of practical issues involved in, in measuring uh, this. I sort of alluded to the, um, the great deal of attention statistical agencies uh, play. I've listed some of these uh, issues here. Uh, Coyle, in her lovely book, uh, talks about them in a much more refined and detailed way. It's a thin book, but it's really well written. I encourage you to work your way uh, through it to um, develop your love and appreciation of gross domestic product. Hey, what better thing to do on a Friday night over a glass of wine? Um, I jest. Um, but here are some rules of thumb that I want you to focus on in using GDP in some issues. One we've come across already, the distinction between nominal versus real prices. So again, nominal or current prices, those words are synonyms, synonyms refer to the actual prices that we ob observe, the prices in the grocery store shelf, on the grocery store shelves, in the coffee shop, in the car dealership. Those are current prices. Real or constant prices, again, those two terms are synonyms, are constructive relative to some base year, and they're not actually observed. So again, I stress the use of the word real here uh, is a peculiarity of the economics language. They're really not real in the sense that they're not out there. We make them up. But they are meant uh, to, uh, to focus on changes in quantity holding prices constant. Because GDP can go up either because prices go up or the amount of stuff that we produce goes up, quantity goes up, and some combination of both. Um, but it's really the real economic activity you want to capture. So if you're ever looking at GDP figures over time, you uh, have to pay attention to um, the use of real prices as opposed to nominal prices. So here's gross domestic product uh, over a number of years from 2019 back to 2015 um, and at market prices, at current prices, at nominal prices in the first row and then at real 2012 dollars. So this is to say we are using the prices that existed in 2012 to get our evaluation of the quantities produced in each of these years. So in 2012, these two numbers would be the same. But already by 2015, there's a divergence uh, between them. And with each year, if you think of um, inflation rates at around uh, 1 or 2 percent, they're actually a little bit less than 2 percent now, but that 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 makes a difference as the years go by. So um, nominally, the United States is a $21 trillion economy. But if you want to make the comparison back to previous years or to 2012, uh, it's a $19 trillion economy. So that's one caution. Making comparisons of GDP over time requires you to use some fixed um, uh, base price. And you can construct that to whatever you want it to be. Uh, right now, statistical agencies are producing this for 2012, but it's easy to convert that to any base year. And generally, if you are um, a journalist or want to communicate more widely, you probably want to base it on the most recent uh, uh, year. The other thing is making comparisons across countries. Let me just pause for another drink here. So you often see some sort of statement in the media like China is a bigger economy than the United States. Well, yes and no. 
So making comparisons across countries uh, requires you to be conscious of two things, sort of, you know, what price are you going to use? Uh, you think you could just use or use exchange rates to convert the currencies in one country into the currencies of the other. But exchange rates fluctuate around for a whole number of different, sometimes just random uh, reasons. So the valuations you get from that are not very stable or, or reliable. And so what statistical agencies have come up with is something called purchasing power parity. Uh, the price that a similar basket of goods would, um, would, uh, would um, fetch in, in different countries and use that as the basis for conversion. Now around purchasing power parities, there are all sorts of issues between tradable and non-tradable uh, 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 sectors, uh, but The Economist in an entertaining way uh, years ago came up with something it called the Big Mac Index. So it went off and priced what a Big Mac, the same commodity, <laughs> uh, homogeneous commodity, the same commodity would cost in different countries and it used that to develop a, uh, an appropriate index for making comparisons across countries. Well, uh, purchasing power parity is sort of a fancy uh, version of that, and it, it comes out of um, the World Bank. And there's a good deal of controversy every time this is revised because it revises the GDP numbers across countries. Well, we're going to use purchasing power parity in which 2011 is defined as uh, 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 one U.S. dollar. So whatever the Brazilian currency was, it could get you only 71 cents uh, 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 U.S. The other thing that you need to be conscious of is just the, the overall differences in the sizes of economies. So I've included here um, the population in, in these selected uh, countries. Um, at one end, Ghana, uh, a country in which the GDP is 149 um, billion uh, dollars and there are 29 million people in that country versus a country like China with almost one and a half 1.5 uh, billion people significantly bigger population than the United States the GDP in China is comparable or a bit bigger than the in the United States in that sense I guess China is a bigger economy than the United States but its population is so much uh, greater than that in the United States. So if you look at GDP per person, per capita, um, um, in China, that's about 13,000 US dollars. Whereas in the United States, it's about 56,000 US dollars. The US is a much richer economy than, uh, than China. All right. So just be uh, uh, conscious uh, of that. Oops. Uh, so fin the final issue I wanted to bring up is GDP as a measure of well-being. Remember what that definition is. It's a monetary value of market activity. And while market activity, monetized market activity, is very important for our well-being, richer countries tend to have citizens who have um, longer lifespans, are healthier, have higher life satisfaction. Um, GDP is not everything and it, it is not equivalent to happiness or life satisfaction or to use that term we talked about earlier, uh, utility. And there's been a lot of controversy and discussion uh, and criticism of GDP uh, for not being a measure of well-being. But remember, it's not intended to be a complete and comprehensive measure of well-being. It's intended to measure aggregate market activity. Uh, and to the extent that it played that role in the post-war period as, as, as being the one and only indicator of well-being, uh, then that criticism is justified. And so there's a lot of discussion now about different types of indices, uh, whether uh, what, what properties an appropriate index should have. Uh, the United Nations Development Program, for example, produces uh, an annual uh, report that focuses on different measures of well-being, um, questions around how you aggregate these things up into a single number, whether you should, uh, are there 
and how they really relate to the fundamental way in which people live their lives are questions. And Coyle also talks about these things. So this is a good exam question, for example, is GDP a measure of well-being? Um, and I list a bunch of other questions. So you might use those questions or keep those questions in mind uh, as you as you do your, your readings. So this is my introduction to macroeconomics and to GDP, and I hope it supports you as you think about this topic over the coming um, uh, week. It's a good place to start because we are on our way to trying to understand overall macroeconomic activity, and this is the metric we use. And uh, as we develop our theory, we're going to relate the movements in GDP to uh, the unemployment rate and to, you know, and to the inflation rate, although we won't be able to say much about inflation in, in the model that we develop, but it'll relate directly to the uh, 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 unemployment rate. Those movements I showed you in the unemployment rate have something to do with the way GDP moved, uh, and uh, you can see that that affects how people lead their lives in a very uh, important way. So um, I want to thank you um, for your engagement. Next lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of measurement, and I'll give you a much more refined and subtle um, conversation. I hope we engage in a more refined and subtle conversation um, on unemployment, and I'll talk briefly about uh, inflation. Over the course of the week, I'll take the uh, class assignments that you've handed in, uh, I'll mark them, and I'll send them back to you for feedback. And I'm wondering, uh, actually, next week, if we uh, might find it appropriate and value, valuable uh, just to pause and meet together, perhaps through Zoom, to take your uh, questions um, and feedback on the assignments and other uh, questions. So if you have any puzzles and things, uh, in how you responded to the assignment, any things, any things or issues that are left undone, um, any wrinkles that you'd like to get ironed out, why don't we collectively engage in a conversation? So send me an email, tell me how you feel about that. I'm inclined to suggest that we should sort of uh, touch bases, um, uh, but I'll take my lead on that from you. Um, the other thing I should say I'm very happy to meet with people through uh, Zoom or another medium, one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. You know, you've paid your money, you've bought your services, feel free to make use of me to uh, further your learning objectives. So if you'd just like to chat, uh, as I said, either one-on-one -on -one or uh, in small groups of two, three, um, Feel free to uh, suggest a, a, a time. And um, we're sort of coming to the point in the course where you are becoming articulate economists, so it'd be good just to uh, practice your language skills. So I'll look forward to uh, hearing from you and engaging with you over the uh, course of the coming week. And, uh, uh, and engaging in a, uh, another lecture uh, next Tuesday. Thanks very much for your attention, everybody. And I hope you're doing well. And please take care of yourselves and the people you care about.